and they were speaking what eventually became known as written Latin, prestigious, prestigious written Latin. Then the Roman Empire falls, and with it the means of enforcing a particular standard. And the moment the Roman Empire force falls, the little variation that existed in all those populations, variations that could have been reported if someone had been carrying a tape recorder like Labov, began to explode in a divergent way. In other words, vulgar Latin, the non-prestigious languages of the masses, as opposed to the language of the ecclesiastical authorities and the language of the aristocracy, vulgar Latin began to become a thousand different forms of romance. Many different forms of Hispano romance, not only Castilian, but Leonese and Aragonese. Many different forms of Franco romance, not only Francien, the, the, the particular dialect of Paris, but all those forms of Provençal, Norman, French, and so on. Many forms of Italo romance, not only Roman, but and Toscan, which eventually became the standard Italian, but the, 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 the language of Milan and the Italian of Venice, each one had its own dialect. And yet, at the same time, very few people understood that this divergence, because the means of transportation were so slow, and the language is formed what is called a dialect continuum of overlapping <coughs> areas, that if you walked slow enough from, say, Paris to Florence, you probably did not even notice the difference. I mean, as long as it was slow enough so you could get used to the different sounds of the different villages that you were going through. It's similar to the situation today with Arabic. Arabic exists in a whole variety of heterogeneous ways, but if you go ask someone in Iraq and then someone in Iran and then someone in, in, in Saudi Arabia, what language are you talking about? Well, I'm not sure Iran is a good example, but you know, in, 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 in Saudi Arabia, uh, I'm speaking Arabic, even though they in fact Arabic exists today as a dialect continuum of overlapping dialects. So in the year 813 AD, our first consciousness, our first awareness of this divergence it started during the, war, during the reign of Charlemagne. Charlemagne, of course, wanted to reconstitute the old Roman Empire, and he, you know, he, he at least had it within his reach. And one of the things, among the many reforms that he, that he underwent, that he undertake, undertook, rather, he wanted to know what's the state of language. So he hired the William Labov of his time, a grammarian called Alcuin. And he said to Alcuin, dude, well, maybe he didn't say dude, but hey, you know, go out there you know, into the streets of Paris, go out there to the streets of Lyon, go out there to the, the, the different parts of my reign, and come back and tell me just what is the state of Latin over there. When Alcuino, Alcuino obviously did not have a tape recorder, so he had to just do it, you know, intuitively, but nevertheless, he exposed himself to the heterogeneity. He was, like, he was not like a Chomsky that asks himself the question, does this sound grammatical to me? And once you say yes, then that's the end of the matter. He went out there to confront the heterogeneity of acoustic matter. And came back and said, hey, uh, Charlemagne, uh, your honor, you know, I don't know what the hell they're talking out there, man, but it is not the Latin that you and I think of it as Latin. And he called it Rustica Romana. This is what today we call Old French. The very name tells you everything. This was a vulgar, it was a, a daughter of vulgar Latin, which was vulgar, it's not the kind of Latin that you're going to use to say, you know, to say mass in, in, in church, for instance, or to sign things into law, or anything other than written Latin is used for, because written Latin you could preserve its continuity with the Roman Empire because you had books by Cicero, books by all the classics that had been preserved by antiquarians, and you could always go back and, and check at least the written version, whether we are sticking to it. And during the Charlemagne uh, years, 
They also came up with new rules of pronunciation for written Latin, so they could be used in, 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 in saying mass and, 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 and making speeches and so on. But out there in the world, Alcuin, just like Labo, discovered there's nothing but heterogeneity. Nothing but heterogeneity. Now, by the 11th century, an incredible wave of urbanization occurs in Europe. It is, in fact, if we make a little diagram here of time versus space, and we say this is the year 1000, and this is the year 2000 AD, and this is the rate of urbanization, how many new cities are being born every year. The curve looks like this, roughly. Sorry. Stuff like that. This is 1300. This is 1500, the Renaissance. This is 1800. The, the upswing, this upswing is produced by the Industrial Revolution. All these new towns that were born around Manchester and Liverpool, coal towns that were engaged in industrial production. <coughs> and so, let me just display a mistake here. And of course, urbanization keeps on growing. I believe uh, it was three years ago that for the first time, the majority of, 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 of humanity in the entire world lives in cities as opposed to rural villages. We just crossed that point about three years ago. Nevertheless, in Europe, this, what, what is mysterious is this first upswing here. Because we tend to think of this as the Dark Ages, and they were anything but dark. They were, in fact, quite modern. They were much more modern, say, than after the bubonic plague hit and eliminated a third of the population of, of, of Europe and forced what now we call the Renaissance to, to begin. This was the real Renaissance. This is when the relationship between church and state between the law that follows from the Romans and religion that follows from the Christians were first worked out. This is when a lot of the cities that were not of Roman origin, cities like Venice, cities like Amsterdam, were born. And, you know, it had to do with economics. So there's a commercial revolution. It had to do with agriculture. They had invented a new, they had invented a horseshoe, a horse harness, and a new method of rotation of fields that increased the production of food tremendously. The more food there is, the cheaper it is, the more kids you can have, the more kids you can have, the larger the population of the village, which becomes a small town, the small town becomes a medium-sized town, the medium-sized town becomes a large town. This incredibly intense rate of urbanization had an effect on the dialect continuum. In particular, by the 11th century, the uses of writing had multiplied. Italy had become a notarial center. Notary publics, as everybody knows, are people who, who, who guarantee, well, even today, that a particular, they see your signature and they put their, their seal so that, you can, so that a particular document can have official value. In the 11th century, all kinds of new uses of writing were needed. Petitions to the king, denunciations of your neighbor, that, you know, that, you know my neighbor is taking part of my land, so I need to make an official denunciation. Post-mortem inventories. Uh, contracts, commercial contracts of all different kinds, insurance contracts. So as, as the commercial revolution exploded and, 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 and people became more and more urban, the needs to have a writing system for those dialects, not for Latin, became very evident because very few people spoke the, the fancy Latin, and of course these people knew how to write in Latin, but all the things that had come out of older Latin, not only Rustica Romana, or all those romances that I was telling you about, uh, needed, I mean, they needed a, a way of spelling. And here is where the capital cities of certain regions, Florence as the, capital, as the regional capital of Tuscany, Paris as the regional capital of the Ile de France, Madrid didn't exist yet, but Castile as a region already existed, and, and of course there were the cities of Leon, uh, uh, Aragon as, as regions, uh, the, the region around Venice, the region about Milan, the regional capitals hired their own grammarians to come up with spelling systems for their languages. 